Hi, welcome everyone. If you're one of the students joining the class, I can see you uh, entering the Zoom room from the participants list that's going up right there. Um, please sign in your name to the chat. And then if you have a question for June, you can go ahead and put that in the chat as well. We will be getting to questions at the end so that if you have any questions for her, um, you'll have a chance to, she'll have a chance to answer you directly toward the end. I just wanna take a moment to thank June Edmonds for being here today. I'm gonna to read a little bit from her Wikipedia page. Um, June Edmonds is an American painter, teaching artist, and public artist. Edmonds' work is notable for its colorful layered surfaces that draw, uh, let's see, that draw meditative practices to explore the relationships between color, repetition, spiritual contemplation, the power of archetypal systems, and interpersonal connection. She's an active and prominent contributor to, to let's see, in the California area. Um, she's had shows um, most recently at Luis de Jesus Gallery, the California African American Museum, the Huntington Beach Art Center, and the Watts Towers Art Center. We're so happy and excited to have you here today. I'm a big fan of, of your work. Um, I just wanna welcome you as a speaker in our uh, teaching and socially engaged artist series here at Cal State Fullerton that's been graciously sponsored by Grand Central Arts Center, as well as the College of the Arts and the Association of Hysteric Curators. We're so happy to have you here today. Um, welcome, June. Thank, thank you, Mariana. It's a, it's a very uh, honor to be here, very much an honor to be here. So um, I could share my screen and show some images. Okay, so uh, share screen. Okay. All right. So uh, this right here is uh, some early work, uh, actually from college. So the date is 1982. I was in undergrad at the time. And when I was in college, I was interested in uh, painting uh, people, you know, friends, basically in interiors, and just interested in uh, involving uh, still life and and landscape in the works of art as well. So uh, this one uh, really shows everything that that I was interested in. Okay, this next one, uh, you know, about a decade later, I, I you know, right after school, I went to grad school at Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. Um, I went to Skowhegan as well, and that was a great experience. Uh, I came back to LA and, uh, you know, practice doing art, was still doing figurative works. And uh, I was living in Long Beach, I was working at LA Times, and I heard that there were these MTA stations that were in Long Beach that were looking for artists. And one of the stations was like a block and a half away from my house. And I felt that that particular station should be mine. I felt like I was the closest artist there. And so I, I worked really hard on my proposal for it. You know, um, I at that time lived down the street from a library, so went to a library and got a video that I watched about 20 times about how to get a grant, you know, because I knew I was pretty new and up against, uh, you know, many experienced people. Uh, one of the one of the recommendations was to, you know, make sure that there were some very experienced people around you that you were working with. So, so I was able to do that. The mosaicist, her name was Monica Sharp. You know, she had done some wonderful commissions and. I work with Peter Carlson, who is a fabricator, and he's worked with, you know, just about everybody and has been in the business for a long time. And so, um, so I was able to get the commission, you know, with, with uh, that team. So, so that was an honor. This is, uh, this is a uh, public artwork that is up right now you know, on Pacific Avenue between 4th and 5th Streets in, in Long Beach. So I've done a few public art, you know, works of public art and did those around the, uh, the 90s, you know, and into the 2000s as well. So, you know, about 10 years later, you know, I got into 
uh, abstraction. And I, I was always interested in abstraction and, you know, uh, being very painterly in my artwork and, and interested in texture and, and uh, the breaststroke and thing like, things like that. And, you know, color was always sort of a uh, forefront for me. And so abstraction just seemed like a natural progression, you know, where I could just really focus on those things. So I, I started this series around this time, but maybe around uh, 2011, you know, I, I got very serious, you know, uh, about building this body of work. Uh, in 2017, you know, I got a grant with the city. I got the COLA uh, uh, Fellowship, uh, which is the City of LA uh, Artist Fellowship. And with that fellowship, you get a grant for uh, $10,000, and that was wonderful. So again, that was just a few years ago, but it was the first time, you know, that, you know, I had this money that I can invest in my practice. So uh, running out of paint was no longer stressful, you know, a new experience. And then I, I had money where I could get myself a studio. So it was the first time I was able to get a studio, you know, so just a few years ago, I got a studio at Angel's Gate, which is here in San Pedro. I'm in San Pedro. Let's see. Uh, and then at that show, I, I showed a uh, work of art that, that was very different. And, uh, and they were these flags. And, and uh, with the show at Unstall, which was the COLA show, you know, I decided that I wanted to use sort of a palette of primary color and primary color that, that came, that went to skin tones. And so in, in the flag, I wanted to use the same palette, but instead of red, white, and blue, you know, I decided to use red, uh, yellow, and blue, which are the primary colors. And we know the primary colors make every other color in the rainbow. And I that there was something very similar about that with, you know, uh, these brown tones, which represent brown skin tones um, because, you know, uh, since we know that, that life started in Africa, that all skin tones really come from these brown skin tones. So, you know, I was, I was making that, uh, that comparison with these flags as well. So this is uh, one of the later ones, you know, that I did this year, this one and this one. And um, and this is sort of the the range of darkness uh, that these particular flags have. And I also uh, did some drape flags. Sort of the original idea was sort of based off of these black drape flags that that you know I saw in a dream. And uh, I was in a show at the beginning of the year at Jill Moniz's uh, place, Quotidian, and uh, she arranged the flags a little bit different. So I, I like the way that she arranged these and sort of consider this to be a collaboration, if you will. And um, at one point, you know, about uh, maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, I, I uh, knew I wanted to teach in college, I have been trying to teach on the college level, you know, since I got out of school in 1984. But, you know, the jobs were really limited and they weren't hiring black people that much back then. You know, they don't hire black people that much now, but hopefully that's changing. But, you know, I decided, let me uh, hone my uh, drawing skills. And so I did a series of, po of portraits just to practice that. And, uh, but maybe I did this one before 2005 because 
I did get one uh, job, a couple jobs in college where I was teaching, you know, drawing and, uh, and design. And so this is some student work. So, you know, I, I talked to your professor, Z uh, Zeal, and she uh, wanted me to share some student work and that uh, you all would be interested in that. This is student work uh, from a college uh, class uh, at Cerritos College, and this is as well. Um, I did teach dual enrollment classes at, at, um, at Jefferson High School, and, and so that was really great as well. I don't have any of that work but I will show you something else that is related to uh, working with those students. You know, I, um, I left Cerritos when uh, an arts organization that I work with offered a full-time, you know, a full-time job. And so, you know, at that time, you know, I was in my forties and, and didn't have health insurance. So I, I went on and took that job. So uh, these are some of the works uh, that of, of, of projects that I did with these elementary school students. So these students and this artwork that we're looking at now is basically K through five. Um, this artwork was inspired by uh, uh, the, the artist Juan Miro and um, the student Derek, uh, his artwork was chosen to uh, benefit the art organization, like a benefit that they were doing to sort of grace the cover of their brochure. So he was very proud of that. Um, other projects that I have done, what uh, inspires the projects that I do are um, are artwork that that I really love and that inspire me and hopefully I think sort of translates you know for the uh, to the younger audience so Barnett Honeywood is an artist that was in LA uh, born in 1950 uh, we lost her very young in 2010 and um, and and she is known for doing these profiles. Uh, this is a shot of my classroom or a little snippet of it. And um, I wanted to show these snippets. I couldn't find any uh, pictures of the whole classroom just to show uh, that I find it to be important to just sort of surround uh, the child with art because they would be inspired by the same thing that we're inspired by, which is other art you know and so there's some barnett honeywood artwork here you'll see a matisse here and of course a frida kahlo here so the lesson was uh to have the children draw themselves in profile and to add uh the uh, uh, west african adinkra symbol so they were to choose their own adinkra symbol uh that they felt represented them Okay, so uh, this is another project. This one was, uh, most of these are from last year or the year before. Um, there's an artist by the name of Anna Serrano and Anna Serrano, she's from LA as well. So uh, that, uh, you know, the old art standards, you know, for fourth grade is, you know, uh, to learn about California artists as well. So um, Ronnie Honeywood would have been one. Those were third graders in that last picture. But this is, um, I did something else. This is also a second or third graders to tell you the truth. But, but with, you know, I sort of keep in mind to bring in uh, California artists and Los Angeles artists as much as I can. And Anna Serrano was one. She's in, uh, Washington, Washington and Oregon right now, but, uh, but she is from here. And so she did a project, she did a work of art 
called Cartonlandia, you know, that is this wonderful neighborhood of cardboard houses sort of stacked up on, on each other. And, you know, again, very kid friendly. And so um, we created these and, and they're very creative. You see, you know, the kids are personalizing it. This is a cat house. You can't really see the door where the door has cat ears, but there's a cat toy and, and cat portrait and a goldfish, I guess, to entertain the cat. But the, the uh, kids were encouraged to uh, be uh, very creative in every step. It's like design your own roof, design your own windows, design your own door. And so uh, that's why you see sort of different shapes for uh, each part or feature of the house. Okay. Uh, another project was uh, something inspired by an artist by the name of Heather Hansen. And she was an artist that uses her whole body to do art. And, you know, I chose her because, you know, she was just so interesting to look at, I thought, and would be from a child's point of view. You know, like she got her initial inspiration. She's a dancer and she went to the beach and she was laying down on the beach sort of making uh, uh, sort of these angels, if you will, and ended up, you know, sort of turning that into a drawing practice where she would have charcoal in each hand and sort of jaw symmetrically as she was doing these movements at the same time. So the idea of that seemed very uh, kid friendly. And so what I had the students do here was uh, sit across from each other. So this is a collaboration and uh, sort of draw with both hands at the same time, but also mirror the person sitting across from them. And so uh, they made uh, uh, collaborative projects like these. Another artist that I chose, who is a LA artist, Heather, Heather Hansen is not, uh, the artist that inspired these. Uh, the, this work right here, this is the fifth grade uh, work. Uh, this is first grade. Uh, the artist's name is Jose Ramirez. Jose Ramirez is here in LA. Uh, he happens to be a teacher as well, uh, a third grade teacher. So. Uh, a, 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 t a teacher that's that's working full time, but a very prolific artist at the same time. And his artwork has all kinds of interesting context. It, I found it to be kid friendly. You know, I love the work, you know. Uh, so for the younger artists, uh, what I loved about his work is that uh, he's a uh, uh, Latino, Latinx artist. I love that uh, he was celebrating sort of the brown skins of that culture. You know, uh, a lot of times when you're working with young kids, you have to deal with them wanting to draw themselves blue eyes. You have to worry about making themselves uh, skin tone, you know. So they, they learn that stuff so early and you know, it really is your job uh, to uh, not uh, to not uh, encourage that, and to just you know not you know just tear down sort of the the white supremacist you know can and that that exists for them as well. So um, so we pretty much focused on that you know the skin tones and and making design in the background, you know, for uh, these first graders. And uh, this is a project that actually I did with a program with Daryl King. And uh, Daryl King was, was working at my art organization uh, in uh, a program that, that goes into different schools and places artists uh, in the schools to work with teachers and work with their curriculum 
uh, for about eight weeks. So I really enjoyed doing that. And so this was uh, a number, there was a number of fifth grade classes uh, that I worked with and, uh, and the curriculum was social studies. So I thought uh, Jose Ramirez would have been perfect and was perfect for the social studies unit they were on, which was civil rights. So uh, Jose Ramirez has a number of books. He was a teacher, so he was on strike a couple years ago. So he has a number of works. You know, go to his website, joseramirez.com. Um, he has a number of works that uh, that have the uh, uh, strikes with the teachers as subject matter. And so there were uh, teachers and students uh, that were holding these signs. And so with the class, we just sort of went through the signs and, and what they were saying and had the, stu had the students um, uh, write down you know, in their art, you know, something that, that they believe strongly about that was pertaining to school. So you'll, you'll see that in uh, these individual pieces. Here's um, a couple of, of these projects up close. You see they included the body as well. So, um, so I, I would start sort of like with the bottom statement here for his where he says use money on schools, not prisons. And uh, this one, you know, is, is anti, uh, anti drug message. Okay. Um, this is another shot of another project, a project uh, inspired by an artist duo by the name of Chowza. And uh, it's paper mache. So, you know, I kind of swore off paper mache for many, many years, but I love this project so much. You know, I, I started doing paper mache with the kids again. So this, this was uh, from a year ago. And also, you know, there's, there's shots of, there's a shot of my classroom and, and one of the things that is very important to me is that every student feels welcome in the classroom. So uh, this here is the Jose Ramirez artwork, you know, and this one is the uh, Anna Serrano. This one right here is Heather Heyer. Uh, this is another Anna Serrano. Uh, I don't remember the name of this artist. You know, we did some uh, brushwork right here. And uh, this one is um, uh, uh, Micheline uh, Thomas. So uh, I love it when I see the kids sort of coming uh, to class or leaving class and stopping and looking at the, uh, of the artwork and connecting to the artwork. So here's some more of the uh, abstract paper mache uh, sculptures. You know, these took a long time to do, uh, but the kids, you know, really love these. Uh, this, you know, I, my background is in painting, but as a, a teacher, you know, you just learn, you just learn uh, different areas of art as you go along. So I understand this, that there are many of you guys that don't have an art background. And even with or without an art background, you could just learn what's interesting or learn what you think uh, the students think are, is interesting as you go along. So um, uh, I, one of my first jobs was at the Armory Center for the Arts and, and they won't even give you a, a classroom until you work under somebody. Uh, which was fine. You don't get paid that much, but it's fine. And uh, and one of the persons that I worked on under, um, uh, I'm going blank right now, but she uh, she was Mariel Mariel uh, Stern, 
was and is, uh, she's still a teacher and she's a, a fabulous ceramicist. So I didn't know anything about clay, but I learned about clay. And then I learned how to teach clay, you know, working under her. So that, you know, working with that other artist was invaluable. And uh, clay is a, a child's favorite thing to do. You know, if they see clay, they're excited. So um, it's, it's something that the kids, my students that I had been working with at La in Lawndale, I have been I have been in Lawndale for about 13 years now. Uh, they have come to expect it every year. So that K through five uh, contract is through um, the arts organization PS Arts that I that I work with. And you hear some more of their beautiful pieces. So you'll see they're all different grades: second grade, third grade, fifth grade. You know. They're all, you know, this taller one right here would be from a, a fourth or fifth grader. So um, at the end of the year, a lot of years, you know, we'll have an exhibition of, uh, that spans the whole, you know, many districts uh, in the South Bay. So we, everybody gets a little space. So this is uh, some artwork from my classes. I did some artwork. Uh, inspired by African-American quilters, uh, Ro uh, Rosie Lee Tompkins being one. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember who the inspiration for these abstracts were. I have to think about it. Um, Margaret Garcia, we looked at some landscapes from the Los Angeles art artist, uh, Margaret Garcia uh, for this a series of trees right here and here's some close-ups this is a, a fifth grade project and i and i think this was like a perfect fifth grade project you know um it hits so many standards fourth and fifth grade you know it hits uh the standards of of uh teaching contrasting colors of comp complementary colors the standard of uh perspective, one point perspective. And, uh, you know, I just added a, uh, a few other things in there, like uh, creating space, you know, because um, using perspectives, uh, perspective is a way of creating space, you know, on a picture plane. So giving them a few more techniques of creating space you know, within a picture plane like overlap and diminishing sizes and, and vertical placement and things like that. So I, I think that's the last, this is the last one. And uh, same project, fourth, fifth graders. Um, so that's it. And I can take any questions that you might have. Let's see. Let me read some. Thank you so much. The, your student work is just stunning. It's really beautiful to look at. Oh, I'm cool. going to start with some student questions because those are always the most exciting. And then I have some from Zeal as well, who's uh, okay. here but not able to join us as a panelist. She's joining us in the participant audience. Unfortunately, we had a technical snafu, so I want to apologize to Zeal for that. Um, so let's hear from some of the students. Let's see, Jocelyn Monk. Uh, let's see, what is your teaching philosophy? Do you have a basic philosophy or approach in the classroom? Yeah. Um, I, one, I want the student to be able to see themselves in the art that I present. I want them to feel that whatever the project is, that it's, it's doable. So, um, so it's basic, it's basically those things, you know, I started, I started a, a drawing class, you know, uh, a dual enrollment drawing class with LACC, uh, a couple weeks ago and, you know, everything's online and, you know, I have this PowerPoint and, you know, just sort of the, the second thing that I had to say to them was, you know, um, I'm using quite a few textbooks, you know, what I'm considering a textbook. 
Uh, but what I found frustrating when I was in school was just how Eurocentric they were. And that in my classes, there, there is just uh, uh, like Eurocentrism and uh, white supremacist uh, curriculum uh, has no place in my classes. So I let them know and, you know, every time they see, you know, whatever level you are, um, the artwork I present is uh, inclusive of all genius. That's remarkable. I mean, it's, your student work is so exciting. I think your excitement about looking and describing the process is evident in their, in their excitement about it, but also it shows uh, sensitivity to what they want to see and they see themselves reflected in the choices that you're making in terms of display. I mean, the names that you mentioned and that they're working people within their community, that's an, an awesome, it's really a great example um, for the students here. Let's see. Um, oh, this is from a student who's, uh, sounds like is one of the child and adolescent study students. Um, let's see, uh, how do kids typically respond to art assignments in a regular classroom? Will they goof off or do they take it seriously? I, I, di I didn't hear the first part of the question. How do kids typically respond to an art assignment? And so this is from uh, a multiple subject credential student. Uh, do they goof off or do they take it seriously? Okay, uh, great question. Uh, with PS Arts, I don't have a teaching credential and most, and a lot of us don't have teaching credentials. That means the teacher needs to be in the classroom when I'm teaching. <clears throat> so 99% of the time, <clears throat> how the students respond is how the classroom teacher, uh, whatever her attitude about art is, you know? So if a teacher comes in and is excited about art, you know, the kids will be as well. You know, kids are naturally excited about art anyway. I mean, you could, you know, the teachers sort of use art all the time as you keep acting up, you guys aren't coming to art. You know, they tell me this all the time. I know that it, it's wrong. You know, don't <laughs> say that to the kids, but they know that the, the kids enjoy it for the most part. So if, if I'm teaching something and the kids are, are acting up because kids are kids, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to question my project. It's like, okay, my project didn't get them. You know, I want my projects to engage you as soon as you walk in and that it didn't happen. So I'm going to question what I am presenting, you know, or, you know, just sometimes you have, kids that are are having a hard time you know they're having a hard time and they don't know how to tell you they're having a hard time or or they're just you know just be a few kids that um that struggle you know so you know it's it's just kind of up to you to sort of figure out you know if you can where you can bring them in, you know, like how, how, uh, how much scaffolding you have to do with the individual. You know, last, last year at a certain school, I had a kid that would just come in and just act up all the time, just come in and that classroom was, was his stage. You know, he didn't have a strong teacher, you know, and so, you know, my attitude was, well, if your teacher's not going to tell you, I'm, I'm going to tell you, you know, and, and, you know, so I did want to establish that there was some authority in the room, number one. And then, uh, so after a few weeks of that, you know, I just started sitting with him just to figure out what, you know, if there was a road in with him and uh, it did turn out that he had just zero confidence in art and just the very basic uh, skills that was needed uh, to get started in the project. It was a, another third grade class. You know, he just wasn't confident in. So 
you know, I had to scale it down. I had to scale it down. I had to scale it down. Uh, but eventually, you know, he did get to work once it was scaled down uh, to a level that he felt comfortable with, you know. So, uh, so as a teacher, it's about balance, you know, like a student like that could just take all, all your time and you don't have time for the other students. So, so you have to really figure out, you know, how, how much uh, time, you know, uh, you can uh, commit to sort of bringing, you know, the other students in, you know, uh, you can't, you can't spend the whole class. You just want to find uh, what, how you can frame something so they can just be engaged and independent. I, I like the way you're talking about it as finding an in with that kid because it is about building those relationships with kids. Totally. And when you figure out what it is that they're terrified of, and then all of their block, their behavior that's blocking, right, that's trying to block the outside world kind of goes away because they trust you with that. Um, and that's, it's amazing. It's, it's one of those things that it's watching a really good teacher in the room do that. It's like watching somebody dance because they know where to spend a little bit mm. of time and they know where they can fly by a little bit faster, but they're kind of always circulating around the room. But just your description of that is, I think, really was very eloquent because it is, you do have to divide your time, but you have to also really find the inroad with each individual kid. It's very powerful. This is an art question from Melissa Vasquez. How do you overcome artist block? Uh, I sort of, I get rid of that term, you know, like, like, um, artist block, you know, I, I, I don't use that term at all. You know, I know that I'm going to have some bad days in the studio, you know, but the, the, uh, goal should be just be, just be in the studio. You know, so if you're in the studio, you might as well pick something up, right? And if you pick something up, you might as well do, you know, so, so you're, you're not going to do masterpieces all the time. You might go, you know, a long time without doing something that you're happy about. But, um, but I would never consider that a block. And I would just consider that uh, you working through something great answer. Um, have you ever had a chance to work with special needs children? And if so, are, are there certain accommodations you might, you usually use or incorporate when you're working with those kids? Yes, I find working with uh, special needs children uh, difficult and rewarding all at once. It's difficult because every special needs class is different, you know, so I've worked with many. Uh, they're different uh, depending on uh, the ability levels of the students, and they're different uh, depending on the teacher. You know, the teacher might be a helicopter teacher, and and there's aides in the class, and it's hand over hand the whole time. You know what I mean? So if it's like hand over hand the whole time, and and you get a lot of that, you know, um, then you know, I, I don't enjoy that because I'm, not, I'm teaching the aid. I'm not teaching the student, you know, so. Um, Can you explain hand over hand? Because I know exactly what you're talking about. That's what right. You know, so what happens in, uh, in these life skills classes is that part of teaching is like, say I'm a student and I'm getting ready to write or getting ready to draw. Well, the A will put their hand over the student's hand and help guide them in their writing or in their drawing, you know, or, you know, in their sculpture or, or anything like that, you know. So um, I, I find that most uh, special ed teachers, unfortunately, are uh, product-centered where most art teachers are process-centered. Yeah, that's an interesting way to describe it, but it does make sense. Um, and I think, you know, 
what you're describing is that it's very frustrating when somebody immediately takes away the student's ability to make any movement that they can make. And instead, are, it's almost like the aide is making the decision for the student about where the mark goes. Right. And that makes sense if you're copying a letter. It doesn't make sense if you're trying to express yourself. So it is always right. a delicate negotiation for those It people. is delicate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, but, but many of the kids, you know, um, uh, they seem uh, to, to, to not be so cognitively present and all they can do is sort of the same move, you know what I mean? A scr a scribble move or, or whatever. So um, whenever there isn't that much training, mm -hmm. you know, for teaching uh, art for special needs, and I've been doing, I've been teaching for a long time since what, like 25 years. So mm -hmm. I look for, I look for it and I can't find it. So I think that that is telling, you know, that's telling. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it is true. There isn't, there isn't a lot dedicated to it for sure in our curriculum and that's right. a good that needs to be filled in. It's an excellent point. Let's see, this is an interesting question from Alondra Gutierrez. Um, and it's about your funding for your classroom art materials, which I'm, you know, it's always interesting to hear how teachers do this. Uh, do you uh, use your own money to provide art materials for your students? Um, or are you, or are they expected to buy their own? Or how does the school handle that? Okay, yeah, so it, it really depends on where you work. If you're, if, of course, you guys are in college, so you know you have to, you have to supply your own art supplies. Uh, for our, the nonprofit I'm with right now, we have a supply budget. And so they came up with some number where each kid, you know, uh, the budget is $5 or whatever for the year for a kid. And so it just really depends where you are, you know, if you're with a museum, if you're with a nonprofit organization, an art center, you know, they have different criteria uh, for budget, but um, but you're you know as a, a contracted I'm a teaching artist as a contracted teaching artist I'm not expected to use my own money to buy the supplies. So uh, you know I did something at Angels Gate a few months ago. You know I got reimbursed. I had to buy the supplies myself, but. Uh, there was a stipend that included reimbursement of supplies. Um, where do you get your creative abstract color ideas from? Um, you know, they're just colors that I, I naturally love to work with, you know, so um, I'm, I am working with a really light palette right now and I, I just enjoy manipulating color and experimenting and learning about it. You're, uh, you're on mute, Mariana. I got it, thank you, I'm sorry. Um, you talked a little bit about, or you talked a lot about establishing a classroom environment so when kids walk in, they see beautiful artwork, they can pause in front of it and that, you know, um, it's, it sounds like, and one of the students is asking about this, um, you know, but how, how do you make certain decisions about that? Or are you um, inspired by, how do you go find work to be inspired by to bring to the classroom? And how do you organize your space? One of the questions is that Zeal asks is related to this. And her question was, uh, when, when do you plan your curriculum or how do you plan your curriculum? So uh, for the longest time, I would take a month out of the year and just sort of dedicate it to uh, planning the curriculum. And that was always August, you know, of course, before the beginning of the year. And so uh, by the time I would step into the classroom, I knew all the artists that I was gonna be covering, you know, so when I was showing uh, that shout, that wowza, that's how you pronounce it, the wowza uh, paper mache sample, you know, all of that artwork was artwork that I was covering. And the same uh, with those Varnett Honeywood self-portraits. 
you know, so in the classroom environment is another tool uh, to use uh, for classroom management, you know, so when you're when your visuals are organized like that, that communicates a certain thing to the students. You know, you have your uh, expectations and your, your uh, uh, routines and your consequences and that kind of thing on the wall as well. Your room is helping you uh, to manage uh, the class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it, that's a great description of classroom management because it is about creating a whole world around the kids and and that makes sense that the rules and the aesthetics all go together yeah um let's see uh who are some of your influences as an artist and how old were you when you knew you wanted to be an artist it's from crystal robles okay um uh, you know so there's so many influences their early influences were uh Barnett Honeywood, Charles White, David Hockney, you know, for these interiors, you know. Um, who else was I looking at? Uh, Romare Bearden, uh, Jacob Lawrence, uh, I love Jacques Do. Uh, and uh, the Impressionists and, and Post-Impressionists and Expressionists, you know, I, I love the way that uh, they use color. So that, those were my earliest uh, inspirations. Like now, you know, um, I just, I, you know, there's just so much, it's, it's really too many to name. Um, I bought in, you know, Amy Sherrall, you know, it's so easy to use her uh, and talk about color and and talk about agent is you know there's just so much you know to talk about with her work you know uh, abstractionist uh friend bowling and uh margaret uh thompson uh, uh uh not so well known uh abstractionist black woman you know so so many of course alma thomas uh you know so quite a few Awesome. This is a really great question. This is from Alondra Gutierrez. I'm very happy you included a lot of cultural diversity in your artwork and even having culturally responsive classrooms. Uh, let's see, the walls and different with different artists and cultural backgrounds. Considering cultural diversity, how do you go about covering controversial issues in your classes? It, it really depends. It depends on the grade. Uh, it, de it depends on the school, it depends on the class. Uh, so when I was doing sort of those, those self portraits with the, with the Ramirez, see, I, you know, I don't know, I'm not versed on all the curriculum from K to five. So one thing that I loved about uh, teaching with the fifth grade teachers I love their spirit, you know, where they were coming from. I love their progressiveness. And they were teaching about, you know, the civil rights movement in the 60s. So, so with that bit of information, I knew I could talk about anything, you know, I could talk about very controversial issues because these teachers were so a conscious that if even if I wasn't presenting something, you know, fifth grade uh, ready, you know, for those ears, that they would uh, present with me to uh, make some of that harder subject matter uh, presentable. So uh, if I'm working with younger students, I, I keep things very simple uh and with older students i i will go out and and uh and say a little bit more but you know it just helps to have the support of the teacher you know and and, and a lot of times you don't have it maybe the the teacher is is very uh uh nonchalant you know uh what's the word and very you know just uh, 
you know, just kind of uh, uh, non-engaged. And so, so you're having that conversation by yourself. And so those conversations are just a little bit more difficult to have, and they're a little bit more difficult uh, to continue on with the next week because you know uh, there was no reinforcement by the classroom teacher. But in the college, in the college class, you know that I'm teaching now. It's been a while since I've taught a college class. You know, I I feel like I I let the students know who I was in the beginning. So, you know, I feel like I can talk about anything. That's awesome. Uh, so I know Zeal likes to end with this question, or the, she's, this is a big question that she always asks, is can you tell us um, like a favorite memory in the classroom or some a memorable event, something that happened that really stood out to you um, in all of your years of teaching? Okay. Uh, you know, I was mentioning that I taught a dual enrollment uh, class, and this was at Jefferson High School. And, you know, one year I had a huge class. It was huge to me. It was like 50 students in the beginning. And, you know, we're just like in a regular class. There's no easels or anything like that. And, and I didn't think that it would work, you know, but... Uh, but it ended up being, you know, just one of my best experiences, you know, that all the students were engaged and they were learning and, and doing great uh, drawings. And we ended up having a sort of culminating exhibition at, at the Dunbar Hotel, which is uh, right around the corner from Jefferson High School. That's amazing. What a cool end of the exhibition to be in a beautiful space like that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's such a, and, and that's an interesting point. So like, you know, the end of the semester, that is something that, um, you know, for our final assessment of critique, do, how young do you, um, you know, because I know we always do great displays for young kids, but taking the work into the community or showing it in a way that it's not normally looked at can be so influential. And then also just having critique with young people. Can you talk a little bit about display and some? I would love to, you know, um, it, you know, like critique with young people, like even with kindergartners, I'm just amazed at how in tune they are with uh, visual uh, communication. Like uh, one time, this isn't a critique, but all the paintings were on the table in this kindergarten class. And there was this, this painting that was just out of this world. And all it was was shapes and colors, but this painting was like, oh my God. And I knew I had that response, but you know, as an adult, you have that response, you know, to a child's work and, and you just assume, you know, because of past experiences, you just assume it's only you. But every single time a child past that particular piece, they were stunned and stopped and said something about this particular work of art. So uh, that, that just never left me, that something uh, so uh, beautiful and so nonverbal could, could be such a beautiful uh, communicator. That's that amazing. everybody understands. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, that's an amazing thought, um, even to end on. I was wondering if there's anything that you didn't talk about that you'd like to talk about or share um, in either area, either teaching or art or things you're thinking about in the studio right now. Um, well, I, I think just when it comes to uh, teaching art, uh, and this, is, this might be a repetition, but but just bring into class what you love and, and what you connect with, you know, no matter what it is. And, uh, you know, one of the places uh, that I get ideas, another one of Zeal's questions, is just going to museums or galleries. And as an art instructor, you start developing uh, sort of a, a radar, if you will. You know, if I go to a museum or an art instructor, a fellow, muse you know, art instructor, then that's what our communication is. Oh, look at this. The kids will love it. 
you know, and and so you just start uh, uh, building an affinity of artwork that that you know you love that you you think the kids will love as well. So I just think that's the best place to start when uh, constructing your curriculum. Thank you so much. That's an amazing thought, an amazing idea. Um, it's been such a pleasure to have you come and talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you.